Welcome to another episode of Handloader TV with me, your host, Jeremiah. And in this episode, we're going to be taking a look at the 7.62 by 25 cartridge and this M57 chambered in the same cartridge. Starting out with the history of the cartridge, the 7.62 by 25 is a bottleneck pistol cartridge, which makes it pretty interesting in and of itself. It was developed around 1930 in Russia, and it saw extensive use throughout the world, but primarily during World War II by the Red Army, and then also in Korea and Vietnam by the communist armies in those conflicts. It gained a good reputation amongst the Russian army, and it was also chambered in numerous submachine guns, in the 7.62 by 25. The cartridge was also adopted by pretty much every European uh, country under Soviet influence in the for late 40s, 50s, and 60s, and so on. In addition to that, I think it's uh, affectionately referred to oftentimes as the mini AK or mini SKS round. And looking at it, it does kind of resemble a small 7.62 by 25. So it's kind of a neat cartridge, and today finding ammo alone can be difficult. Finding 7.62 by 25 can be a real challenge. There is some surplus available on the market, however a lot of that is Burdan primed or it's corrosive or both. So hand loading for this cartridge makes a lot of sense. A lot of people also refer to this as a relatively hot cartridge, however CIP has set maximum pressure at 36,000 PSI, which is really comparable to 9mm Luger. However, it does use .308 diameter bullets, maybe 311, 312, depending on your bore size, it can vary some. But that allows for a smaller diameter bullet, and therefore you can gain some pretty impressive velocities out of this little cartridge. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the firearm, and we'll detail that. As far as firearms chambered in this unique little cartridge go, selection is rather limited. However, the examples we do have, they were produced in rather prolific numbers. I've seen numerous Soviet-made TT-33 pistols and many copies of those pistols made by European countries, such as this M57 we have before us now. I've also seen Chinese copies, they're called the Type 54 pistol, very similar to this example we have here, but a little bit different. And also I've seen commercially available semi-automatic versions of the Russian PPS-43 submachine gun. Those are pretty neat if you're looking for something with a little longer barrel. In addition to those, there's also the CZ-52, which is chambered in the same 7.62 by 25 cartridge. And lastly, I've also seen 1911 replacement barrels for this cartridge as well. However, shooting this cartridge in the 1911 platform does offer some unique challenges. The primary one being the magazines. It's difficult to load more than four or five cartridges in those magazines without it starting to bind up. But it's an interesting and unique option. The firearm we have before us today, which we'll be doing all of our testing with, is a Zestava Arms manufactured pistol, and it was imported to the U.S. by PW Arms, and it's designated the M57. It's a copy of the TT-33 Tokarev pistol, and I purchased this pistol from Palmetto State Armory for about $200, which I thought was a pretty fair price at the time. Taking a closer look at this, there is one little gripe I have about it, and it's no fault to the importer or manufacturer, but it does have a safety right here. Because of U.S. importation laws, they're required to add some sort of safety to the firearm, and this is what they did. You won't find this on the original TT-33 Tokarev pistols, because they designed them to be carried, and we are clear here, with a round in the chamber, and then you'd place the hammer into this half cock position, like so, and what that would do is it would actually bind up the slide, so the slide cannot be pulled to the rear, and the trigger cannot be depressed either, and that was what was considered safe. So from there, you could cock the hammer and fire the pistol. Kind of interesting, I'm not sure how I feel about that, but it's unique and it's different and I find it rather fascinating. 
So let's go ahead and talk a little bit more about the mechanics of this pistol. It does feature John Browning's signature system here. It is a short recoil tilting barrel design. So it does have a locked breech. You can see that barrel tilt ever so slightly. And a lot of people refer to this as the Russian 1911. Now as far as disassembly is concerned, it's a relatively simple and straightforward operation. We have this little bar here, which I like to use the magazine without marring the finish very carefully. I'll use the magazine to pop that off like so. Then from here, I can pop out this piece. And then the slide simply separates from the frame. Now we have our recoil spring on a hinged guide rod. And what's really neat about this is comparing it to the 1911, it has a much simpler trigger pack here. It's not all individual pieces like the 1911, but rather it's all housed together. And it houses your hammer and everything. So that's kind of neat and makes for very easy maintenance, cleaning, and disassembly. So we'll go ahead and drop that guy back in there. To reassemble, it's very simple and straightforward. Slide that guy back on. And we'll line up this pin here. Like so. And then from here, I can again take the magazine because I don't have much for fingernails. And I'll carefully pop that back in without marring the finish. And just like that, we're good to go. One other thing I should point out here is the gun does have a magazine safety. It will not fire without the magazine inserted. And I am not a big fan of that, but that's what it has. And one final thing to note before we move on here. There are also other magazines available, like this one here, which is an eight round magazine. Well, this M57 actually uses a nine round magazine. And you'll be able to see the difference in length here. If I try and insert this magazine in, it doesn't lock and it can simply be pulled out. So make sure if you have an M57, you get the correct magazine. Now that you know all about the firearm here, let's go ahead and jump over to the hand loading side of things. On a real quick side note, I also tested the trigger pull weight of this firearm and it broke at five pounds, 10 ounces on an average of five pulls on a Wheeler Engineering trigger pull gauge. And also it features fixed sights. They're not easily adjustable. However, our pistol fortunately did seem to be zeroed at about 25 yards. So I expect at 15, it'll be shooting a little bit high depending on the load and, and there's gonna be some variation there. So jumping over to the hand loading side of things, we've selected Lee dies. It's a three die set from their pace setter series. It includes a shell holder as well. And it even comes with a little scoop, which is kind of nice if you like to scoop out your powder and then trickle up to proper charge weight. And to avoid being redundant and taking up more of your time, I'm just gonna go ahead and tell you exactly what we did to hand load for this cartridge. It's just like hand loading for any other bottleneck cartridge. And we covered it in great detail in our 5.7 video. So if you wanna check that out, I'll be sure to post a little link up there in the corner of your screen for that. Now, what we went ahead and did is screwed the full length sizing die down until it contacted the shell holder. And since it is a bottleneck pistol case, I did put a little bit of case lubricant on there, some Hornady Unique, and I went ahead and sized all the cases. And then I went ahead and expanded the cases to whichever bullet I was using. And then from there, we simply primed our brass, CCI 500 primers. We weighed all of our powder on an RCBS Matchmaster scale, and all powder charges are accurate to four hundredths of a grain. Then we went ahead and seeded our bullets using the Lee seating, seating die. And I must apologize, I generally like to use the Lee factory crimp die, especially with the Lee die sets. They're a great crimp die. 
Unfortunately, at the time of this filming, I just couldn't find one in stock for this cartridge. So I wound up having to use the built-in crimp feature on the die, which I performed as a separate step. So with all that said, you know all about the loading. There's one other little caveat that I should mention. A lot of people will say it's perfectly safe to shoot a 30 Mauser in a 7.62 by 25. Uh, generally speaking, yes, it's safe, but I can't endorse it or encourage it. If you're going to shoot 762 by 25, stick to 762 by 25. And in under no circumstances should you ever shoot 7.62 by 25 out of a 30 Mauser. 762 by 25 has a much higher pressure and it will damage the 30 Mauser firearm. So, especially if you're hand loading, you can get 30 Mauser dies to hand load 7.62 by 25. That will work just fine. Dimensionally, it's almost identical. So that will work. However, I don't encourage swapping ammunition around. It can be very easy to get yourself into trouble doing so. With that, let's go ahead and we'll take this firearm out, hit the range, and we'll see what it's capable of. This next load will be using Alliant 2400 powder, a 9.6 grain charge with a 93 grain Lee cast bullet, Starline cases, CCI 500 primers, and our overall loaded length is 1.300 inches. Load up, and we'll put them on the paper. So another day, another load, weather conditions and everything else is pretty much the exact same, nothing's changed. And we have a slight breeze at zero to three miles an hour coming from about the five o'clock position. For this load, we're gonna be using Accurate Number no. Seven Powder, a 7.4 grain charge with an 85 grain Sierra round nose bullet, CCI 500 primers, Starline cases, and our overall loaded length is 1.345 inches. Load them up and send them down. Rolling right along here, we are going to be using Shooter's World Powder, a 9.6 grain charge with a 75 grain Lyman cast bullet, cast from mold number 311252. It's 75 grains in weight, using Starline cases, CCI 500 primers, and an overall loaded length of 1.280 inches. Let's see what kind of velocity we can get out of these little cast rockets here.
Up next, we're using Vitavori N340 powder, a 4.5 grain charge with a 85 grain Hornady XTP. Now this is a 32 caliber bullet, so it's a little bit bigger, but I think it'll be all right in this particular firearm. It's got a little bit oversized bore. We're using Starline cases, CCI 500 primers, and an overall loaded length of 1.224 inches. Next up in the load development series is Accurate Number 9, a 9.1 grain charge with an 85 grain Sierra round nose bullet, CCI 500 primers, Starline cases, and overall loaded length of 1.345 inches. Let's go ahead and see what Accurate Number 9 can do. So we're back from the range now after a pretty long day at the range, multiple days shooting this firearm. We put over 250 rounds through it and I believe we put over 25 different hand loads through the firearm. And if you guys would like to check out each of those loads individually, we post all of our results to our website, loaddata.com. You can go on there, type in 762 by 25, look for the hand loader TV loads, and you'll be able to see the group sizes and all the good information that we show you here in the video. Obviously, for time's sake, we can't squeeze that all in, so we're gonna go ahead and show you the best results. And we'll take a look at our first target now, which is using Alliant 2400 powder with a 93 grain Lee cast bullet cast from mold number 311-93, and we got a decent group size of 1.60 inches with the flyer. If you remove that one flyer, it measures out to 0.71 inches, and you'll notice the extreme spread's pretty wild here at 130. And this is something that I kind of have seen repeated in this particular cartridge, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Moving along to our next target, we used Accurate Number 7 powder, and this powder performed really well across the board. This particular load did not yield the lowest extreme spread, but there's going to be a caveat there. If you look at the first shot, it was way high, and generally we don't have chronograph errors. However, I think this is a potential chronograph error because if you remove that first uh, shot, that first velocity, it drops it down to an extreme spread of 36 and a standard deviation of 15, which is pretty good in my book. And the group size measured out to 1.04 inches. I'm very happy with that. And Accurate 7 really made for a nice light recoiling load. The next load, we went ahead and switched over to Shooter's World Major Pistol Powder, a 9.6 grain charge with a 75 grain Lyman cast bullet from mold number 311252 and we got a standard deviation of 49 and an extreme spread of 106. No chronograph errors that I could tell here based off the proof channel on the ALR35 
Everything seemed to be in order. We just had a pretty wild extreme spread, but a decent group size of 1.97 inches with the flyer. Again, you remove that flyer, it's 0.79 inches. So not terrible. And I, again, I think this could be pretty common results with a surplus pistol in varying condition. The next load we tried out was with Vitavori N340 powder, a four and a half grain charge, and we actually used a 85 grain Hornady XTP bullet. However, this bullet was a 32 caliber bullet, 0.312 inches in diameter. I just so happened to slug my bore size on this pistol and it measured out to 0.311 inches. And there's plenty of published data and pressure data available for this bullet. And it performed very well and was mild recoiling and velocity was well within parameters here. Still a little bit wild extreme spread of 118. And I will say this, I do think that some of that has to do with the crimp that was applied. I'm not sure how uniform it was. And I think the addition of a Lee factory crimp dye or a similar collet crimping dye would greatly help reduce that extreme spread. Because as I cleaned the pistol after we were done shooting, I did notice a lot of unburnt powder in there, which tells me a stronger crimp might help completely burn that powder. Moving along to the next load here, we used Accurate number nine powder, a 9.1 grain charge with an 85 grain Sierra round nose bullet. This is an outstanding bullet for the Tokarev and I'm a big fan of it. And again, we had a little bit wonky chronograph numbers here. If the sun is just right, usually almost casting a vertical shadow, sometimes we can get errors. And again, I believe the first velocity here of 1,273 was an error. And I don't think the extreme spread was actually 240. Because if you remove that first shot, it drops the extreme spread down to 33 and a standard deviation of 12. And as you can see, we got a fairly decent group out of that load there. So all in all, I'm pretty happy with these results. I can't complain. This is what we got. And I think this is pretty common to what you can expect out of a surplus pistol. So now you guys know all about the firearm, the cartridge, and you've seen the results we've gotten for yourself. And you can make an educated decision whether this is something you're interested in and would like to tinker with, or if you'd rather just leave it alone. That decision, of course, is entirely up to you. We show you the results as we get them. However, to throw my two cents into the hat, I do really like this pistol. I think it's a very cool, neat piece of history to start out with. And a lot of people do complain about the ergonomics of the pistol. However, we're clear here, it doesn't feel bad in my hand. And I found the recoil very manageable. While I do like the high beaver tail of a 1911, I don't find it a deal breaker on this particular handgun. And I do think it's a lot of fun to plink with and the cartridge is very accurate. And because of its high velocity, it's also easier to achieve hits at further distance which personally I'm a big fan of. You can really reach out there and touch some things with this pistol. So I do think the accuracy could be better. Uh, that left a little bit to be desired in my book. I generally like groups under an inch, especially at 15 yards. However, it is a surplus pistol and the bore is a little bit oversized for some of the bullets we were shooting, in particular the 85 grain Sierras. But that said, I don't think it was terrible and I don't think it was bad. And one final thought when it comes to hand loading this cartridge, it can be a bit tedious to get that bullet to sit flush and straight in the case. It has a tendency to want to wobble on you and sit crooked and cockeyed. However, if you take your time and seat it straight, you should have no issues when it comes to hand loading. It's a relatively simple and straightforward process. So there's my two cents, take it for what it's worth. With that, we wanna thank you so much for watching this video. We really do appreciate it. If you learned something or liked what you saw, be sure to give us a thumbs up and let us know. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button and the bell icon so you're notified when we post our next video. And as always, if you have any questions, comments, personal experience you'd like to share with us with this firearm or hand loading the cartridge, we'd love to hear from you. We do our best to read and respond to every one of those. So thank you so much and I will catch you in the next episode. <music>